take a, a, a minute to, yes, now we're live and um, we'll get, uh, if you wouldn't mind, we'll just uh, start with a little prelude and I'll request Trisha here okay. uh, to okay. get us started and then eagerly look forward to your, to your message. Thank you okay. so much. And, and, then a Q, and then there's a Q&A. &A. Is that what I understand? Or a conversation? There is. Yes. Yes, yes. Your Excellency. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, We've no, got no. young people from a number of geographies around the world who are eagerly... I saw that. Look, it looks very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ash. Hello, Her Excellency Mary Robinson. Um, first of all, I would like to give some general instructions to the audience and the participants. Please keep yourself muted um, uh, so that it doesn't create any disturbance. All the hashtags and social media credentials will be shared uh, in the chat itself. If you have any questions during the address, please put them in the chat and we will take it towards the end of the, uh, towards the, end of the discussion. Um, so today we are very fortunate to be joined by Her Excellency, Her Excellency Mary Robinson. How can we introduce a woman who is addressed with so many titles and identities? She is an activist, a president, a climate advocate, and above, above all, a humanitarian. She loves people and people love her. She's the one who has worked with three generations and even today is fighting for the human rights of the upcoming generations. She eliminated the light on injustice and embraced this issue as part of herself. I would like to read her. I would like to uh, tell you more about her. Uh, she is an adjunct professor for climate justice in Trinity College, Dublin, and chair of the elders. She served as a president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997 and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2000. She is a member of the Club of Madrid and the recipient of the numerous honors and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom from the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Between 2013 and 2016, Mary served as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy in three roles. First, for the Great Lakes region of, the Af of Africa, then on climate change, and most recently as his Special Envoy on El Nino and climate. Her foundation, the Mary Robinson Foundation Climate Justice, established in 2010 and came to a, to a plan and in April 2009. <laughs> A former president of the International Commission of Jurists and former chair of the Council of Women World Leaders, she was president and founder of the Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative from 2000 to 2010, and served as honorary president of Oxfam International from 2002 to 2012. Her Excellency serves as a patron of the International Science Council and patron of the board of the Institute of Human Rights and Business, is an ambassador for the B team in addition to being a board member of the several organizations, including the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and the Aurora Foundation. She was chancellor of the University of Dublin from 1998 to 2019. She is, a, uh, in her memoir, Everybody Matters, was published in September 2012, and a book, Climate Justice, which is Hope, Resilience, and Fight for a Sustainable Future, was published in September 2018. Welcome, Her Excellency. We are very fortunate to have you today. Over to you, Dr. Ash. Thank you very much, Trisha. A very warm welcome and much gratitude. Uh, Your Excellency, we're delighted, we're thrilled, we're honored, and uh, we eagerly await your message. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that very warm and too long introduction. But it probably left out something that a young audience might appreciate, that I now have a podcast called Mothers of Invention. And we say that climate change is a man-made problem that requires a feminist solution. So maybe some people might like to check that out. But let me begin my formal um, address to you before the Q&A afterwards with some great young people. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm really delighted to contribute to this, the second international conference and pop festival for youth-led climate action. I've been told this is a truly global gathering today, that we have young people joining us from every corner of the world. In some ways, it's wonderful to see so many young people taking up the issue of climate change and demonstrating such leadership 
in their contexts and communities. In some ways, it's also a tragedy. Future historians may find it hard to explain why at the start of the 21st century, so often it has been up to you, the children and youth, exhibiting the bold leadership needed to tackle the climate crisis and not more senior figures in society. They may rightly ask why your parents and grandparents acted so late. Perhaps they might say our slow reaction to both the causes and impacts of the crisis were the fault of institutions that have tended to work in silos and through government structures set up in a different era. Perhaps they will blame the greed of short-term thinking and economic gain of the few that, has placed, that was placed above the well-being of the majority. Maybe they will say that the scale of the complex change challenge was so huge, the risks so complex, that we had simply neither the skill nor the will to address it. But what we cannot deny in the year 2020 is knowing what we are up against or what we need to do. We have the scientific knowledge. We know that the world is already at least one degree Celsius hotter than it was between 1850 and 1900. From more frequent and extreme storms to unprecedented heat waves, we're already feeling the impacts of human caused global warming. The science tells us this will get worse. And if we don't urgently and radically change human behavior, in many parts of the world, conditions will become simply unlivable. We have international agreements for change. In 2015, as you know, 196 countries signed on to a collective plan to combat climate change and adapt to its impacts. In signing the Paris Agreement, world leaders decided to eliminate the release of heat trapping gases by 2050. To do this, they committed to cutting their national emissions over time until 2050. This year also marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, the 25th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which emphasized the importance of women's role in peace and security affairs, and the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Agreement on the 12th of December, a few days time. Landmark dates in our diaries, okay. Young people like yourselves have continued to demand climate action and action for peace and justice throughout 2020, despite the constraints imposed on all of us by the COVID-19 pandemic. The relationship between climate change and security threats is very clear. Inaction on climate change leads to heightened peace and security risks. But how does this impact you as young people? According to the UN Secretary General's report on youth, peace and security, presented to the Security Council earlier in 2020, and I quote, young people face significant challenges stemming from globalization, violence, demographic shifts, inequalities, new technologies, forced displacement, shrinking civil space, changing labor markets and climate change. For those of you joining this conference, these words won't be any surprise. You will already be experiencing some of these acute challenges. Estimated, es estimates indicate that young people between 15 and 24 years of age number 1.2 billion and account for more than 15% of the whole global population. You're part of the largest youth population in human history. When we look at the poorest countries in the world, we see that their populations predominantly consist of young people. When we look at the most fragile situations, countries where conflict is a daily reality, we see large youth populations. For example, in countries like Somalia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Sudan, Sudan itself, Afghanistan and Mali, up to 80% of the population are under the age of 30. And history tells us that young people with all their potential can go in two different directions. Either they become productive members of their society, sharing all of that potential and talent, or they see no prospects for themselves or their families. And a huge number of young people with no serious prospects in life brings a lot of risks. So it's vital we actively involve youth in peace 
security, climate governance, work and decisions. So what can we do so that historians in the future might look back at us a little bit more favorably, particularly my generation? What I like about the intergenerational dialogue today is that it's different. It's no longer just the elder imparting wisdom to the young person who listens respectively, respectfully. It's a more balanced exchange because the young are digitally smart and have a vision of the future that we want. It's a dialogue where we learn from each other and we learn together. We need sustained and transparent dialogue at all levels between youth and decision makers so that your ideas are both heard and implemented. Conferences like this are inspiring and provide a space for learning and discussion. However, we also need to ensure all young people have access to a decent education so that they're able to participate in decision-making. This means increasing public access to important decision-making events and processes, and is especially important for historically underserved and marginalized communities, vulnerable populations, and indigenous peoples. As young people, you may not think you can play a role in this, but you can. You can put pressure on your local and national governments to include young people in their decision-making. As young adults, you have a responsibility to vote and get involved in the political process. If you're already a young person from a group in society that has the privilege of being heard, consider offering up your seat at the table for a young person from a marginalized group or one who wouldn't otherwise be listened to. Be generous in the way you support each other. But let me be clear, the burden should not be on the youth to change. One of the greatest injustices of all when we think about the climate crisis is the awful weight of responsibility it places on your generation and future generations. We need leaders to amplify your voices in their respective communities. We need more opportunities for youth to cultivate leadership capacities. And we need to see the kind of collaboration that is imperative in addressing global crises like the climate emergency. Climate change is a unique security challenge. It is an enemy with no leader and no manifesto, but it is not an invisible enemy. It's already destabilizing societies and it is gaining strength. Often we describe climate change as a risk multiplier or even a catalyst of conflict, but it's not nature herself that is against us, quite the opposite. Perhaps the most tragic thing about this crisis is that this adversary is a foe of our own making. And both nature and humanity are now suffering. Our unsustainable consumption of Earth's resources and our reliance on fossil fuels means that there are already inevitable consequences of climate change. But we do have an opportunity to tackle this opponent and reduce and eliminate those risks. We have a chance to build back a better world. I personally, because I'm an elder, don't really use social media much myself, but I've come across this phrase that is apparently popular as a hashtag on Instagram and Twitter, 2020 is canceled. I understand why many people would wish to cancel this year. It has been a terrible and hard year for our whole world. So many have suffered because of the coronavirus pandemic and many more will continue to suffer as our economies struggle to recover. COVID-19 has dealt an historic blow and we've all been left reeling. But the truth is that we cannot afford to cancel this year or any year. As young activist Greta Thunberg famously said in 2019, change is coming whether you like it or not. But what has not yet been determined is what kind of change we will see. My challenge to you today and to myself is to consider what is possible if we all pull together to rewrite the history books before they're even written. We still have the opportunity to embrace the future with bravery, tenacity, hard work and action. And it will take all of us, you, the young people, holding those in power to account, and those of us who are a little older and some a lot older, doing all we can to put pressure on governments to radically alter the trajectory they are on. They are not heading for a safe world, they have to change, and they have to do it by the COP next year in Glasgow. I'd like to finish 
with the words of another young climate activist, David Mbago from Ecuador. He said, it's about uniting against a common adversary that requires collaboration, intelligence, and most important, willingness to take responsibility and action. We have the facts, we have the evidence, and we also have the power, the power to hold governments accountable, but also to speak up and mobilize our communities to take action. So thank you for already being part of a movement of young people taking action, mobilizing and speaking up. This crisis needs all of us united across generations. Together, let's do our best to deliver a healthier, happier and more secure future. And now I'd love to hear some of your comments. Thank you. Uh, I think you're on mute, Dr. Ash. Sorry, I was saying thank you very much, Your Excellency, for an extremely powerful and inspirational message indeed, and definitely one that uh, the young people I know who are in the room and watching via social media resonate with uh, in a profound manner um, as we come together today uh, with that hope to change the course of history. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, at this stage, I'd love to be able to invite some of our young people who are here with us to, um, to share their, their thoughts, questions, and comments. Um, to begin with, I'll invite oui. Meta. Pardon me? Yeah. Meta, uh, please. If you could thank just you so introduce much, yourself, Ash. where you're from. Please, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ash. Um, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for the great speech. I, I really yeah. enjoyed it. Um, you know, the problem we have currently yeah. is the fact that leaders have different motives and ways of handling um, different circumstances. Um, the way you have presented your speech here shows you are open and willing to engage young people in whatever you are doing. Um, what is the solution you are presenting for countries that are having leaders that are undermining the youth? Um, for example, I want to say my countries an example of it, but I believe the leaders in my country that are having that mindset of these are youth and in most cases, they consider youth as chaotic. They consider youth as um, probably, probably people who want cheap popularity. As soon as someone stands up to give up their point of information or try to give their sense of direction towards something. So what word do you have for such leaders or how do you expect youth to react towards such situations? That's a very interesting and not an easy question to answer, but thank you for it. Um, it is a problem uh, when we have outliners, uh, uh, you know, deniers of climate change, for example, at the highest level, for example, in the United States at the moment, problems in Brazil, problems in the Philippines and, and, and in other countries, as you said. Um, I think it's important that we have a kind of peer pressure that can help a lot. And what the Paris Agreement effectively with its 196 countries signing up was a kind of collective peer pressure. And it worked because just before it, President Obama and President Xi of China kind of challenged each other and pushed each other and said, we've got to do something. So we knew that we would get the Paris Agreement once those two lined up together. Now, unfortunately, we've been missing leadership from the United States, but I think we will get it with the Biden administration very strongly and with John Kerry having been appointed because he's very passionate about the issue. Um, and China has been giving leadership. It has committed to be uh, carbon neutral by 2060 at the latest. And um, this is such a pivotal time. That's why I want all of you young people, um, I know you're stepping up already. I want you to step up a bit more or pop up a bit more because it's so crucial. Uh, we have to get these countries, including those with not great leadership, authoritarian or populist, we've got to get them dragged into much more ambition by the COP next year in Glasgow. That's the, that's, that's the truth of it. And, and I'm really hopeful that we can do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mida. 
Um, I think we have Salvesh uh, who also wants to yeah. ask a question. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Priyanka is next, and then we'll go over to Salvesh. Okay. Thank you. Priyanka, uh, please. So yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Ash. Um, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for the absolutely wonderful uh, speech. It's so uh, it's a big honor for me to be a part of the same discussion with you and also to get this opportunity to present a question to you. Uh, I will try to keep my question as short though. I have a few things that I wanted to uh, add context to before I ask my question. Um, so as someone who is belonging from a developing country such as India, uh, the past nine months have brought to light a lot of uh, difficult issues uh, with respect to be the migration crisis, um, or even with respect to the unemployment rate, which is hit the highest ever. Um, and in all of this, the vulnerable communities obviously have been affected the most. And in addition to it, the last nine months, you've seen three of the worst cyclones hit our country, which also shows that environment is also uh, something that's bringing to light uh, that this pandemic is not favoring us. Um, India by nature has the highest youth population in the world, uh, ranging from the age of 15 to 30. Uh, now, when we see our leaders try to build back better, what we do notice is that they are trying to respond to the immediate crisis, as, crisis at hand, which would be something like the migration crisis, where people trying to go back to their rural towns are suffering, and that's what they're trying to answer to. Um, so while they're trying to come up with these policies to respond to these emergency crises, somewhere sustainable, sustainably building back better and the environment is taking a back seat. So uh, my question would be, as youth, how do we ensure that they continue hearing our voices for giving priority to the environment? And at the same time, how do we ensure that leaders are keeping environment and you know, coming, building back sustainably in mind while also trying to respond to these emergency issues that the pandemic has highlighted? Well, thank you very much, Priyanka. Um, first of all, for... Uh, your kind of description of India. I actually know a little of that from a very good friend and mentor of mine. You see, even I need mentors too. Ila Bat, Ila Ban, uh, who formed the yes. Self-Employed Women's Association. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I know from Sewa that they are helping people desperately affected by COVID-19 and the inequalities. It kind of has exacerbated all of the inequalities and uh, that, that's a problem. And, but you're right we still have to remember that COVID is an immediate urgent problem. So it has to be the priority, but it doesn't take from the fact that there is still this looming climate crisis with great urgency behind it. And I think the best way uh, is to try to make climate action as practical on the ground as possible, as practical in helping health issues, in helping jobs issues, in helping um, women, to um, you know, come together in a group for um, better resilience, help resilience in their families, um, local cooperatives, um, you know, whatever it takes, try and you know, be practical and local in uh, dealing with the immediacy of the COVID and the food security, et cetera, but actually do it in a way that links with being sustainable with the climate crisis. Now, um, I'm saying that to you, Priyanka, in India, I'm saying it to me in Ireland, to all of us, um, we all have to um, address and, and, and actually learn lessons from COVID. Maybe I can just mention briefly four lessons that I think COVID has taught us um, very briefly. The first lesson is that collective human behavior actually matters because it's the only thing protecting us from the virus. And when we're, we come out of the climate, um, in particular in the developed world, we have to have collective consumers who consume less producers who produce less. You know, we have to learn that collective behavior. Secondly, government matters. Um, and I've already mentioned that, you know, we have bad governments, but actually a lot of the women-led governments have been doing well in the COVID time. Thirdly, science matters. And that's something you children and youth have been telling us over and over. Now you can really draw on the example of COVID. Listen to the health experts, listen to the climate scientists. And then the last thing, and this is a subtle one, but it's very real. Compassion matters. I'm sure in India, and I know it from Ilaban and, and Sewa, um, th there's a great sense of reaching out to those most affected, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the day laborers who've had to migrate out of the cities and where, where are they getting their food? What are they doing for their families, etc. 
um, the children, the girls who are out of school and pushed into early child marriage. Um, the elders have been very hardworking to tackle child marriage with a whole network of girls, not brides. And we are so sad to see that child marriage is on the increase because of COVID. So um, to try to make it as practical and realistic in people's lives as possible to connect really with the climate urgency, that, that's the best advice I can think of. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Many, many thanks for, uh, for that. And I, uh, I think that message of uh, love, empathy, and compassion is one that's very, very powerful. Um, you know, and, and, and we'd love to be able to spread that message and uh, goodness within, uh, you know, this generation and many more to come. So thank you very much for sharing that. I did want to ask you, Your Excellency, would you have a few minutes uh, for, for some additional questions, please? Yes, just a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. So, so over to you, Saru. Um, love to hear your question. Saru? Okay, I think Saru might have a connection. Saru's in Malaysia, and I, I know that there's been some connectivity issues there. Uh, I'm going to ask Yovana, in the meanwhile, if you wanted to uh, ask, please, uh, you want to share your question, and then we will track Saru down. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ash. Uh, first thank of you. all, um, thank your excellencies for so inspiring uh, speech and a very uh, wide message that you sent to all of us. I am saying welcome from capital of Montenegro, Podgorica, from University of Donja Gorica. And I'm apologizing because my camera is, didn't turn off, but the oh. connection today is uh, <laughs> very low <laughs> and I don't know why. Uh, my question was related actually the finding the, the balance uh, between physical security and the daily activity that make up our lives during the COVID crisis. But you give the brilliant answers, giving these four, uh, four marks actually what are important, uh, uh, what you see like you see important in all this process. Uh, but also we can maybe can talk also what you think, how we can um, achieve uh, security uh, in economic, healthy, also the food systems. Uh, in my mind is also always this picture where we have a small shark eaten by big shark, where the, at the end mm. are the climate change, <laughs> who will eaten all of us. So mm. maybe just the brief comment, what you think uh, it should be maybe following steps um, regarding the air security in uh, in all sex sectors. Thank you a lot. Well, thank you, Jovanna, for that um, question. And uh, I, I too have seen the image of the three sharks, and it's quite frightening. So, uh, but uh, you know, I, I like your point about the need to have a balance in physical security and other security, um, and and that is really important. And um, again. Uh, Sometimes um, security comes from linking in relationships with others. That can help a lot. Um, uh, I, I have dealt with the most terrible conflicts, so I know how difficult it can be. And I, I, as I said, I know that many of the countries of conflict, as I mentioned, are countries with very young populations, very affected, uh, very unemployed, um, terrible problems of food security. But very often combining together, working together, in some kind of a mini credit way, in some kind of a cooperative way can um, enable to address. But I want to use your question, even though it's not part of it, if I may, to say during this COVID year, we also have to have more attention to self care, to actually caring about the mental and emotional um, health of all of us. Um, in this COVID crisis. It's not an equal crisis. It, it's not a great leveler, but some people have called it, not at all. It actually, as I said, exacerbates the inequalities, but we're all feeling the mental strain. And I think it's really important to take time to self-care, to, to, to be kind to yourself and to be kind to your, those you're in immediate contact with and ask them, are they okay? Uh, you know, ask them, are they okay? Because maybe they're not so okay during COVID. And that's also part of a personal security and um, uh, the balance of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Your Excellency. Um, Saru, are you back? 
Um, I don't think so. Maybe okay. Sherry has a question she has so, mentioned. So I'll, I'll just club them, Dusha. Uh, there, are three, okay. there are three questions, um, Your Excellency, and I'll put them uh, to you as one. Uh, I know it's got okay. parts. Okay. They're from, from uh, various parts of the world, uh, Mexico and, uh, and Asia and elsewhere. So I, there's one question, which is about uh, the fact that education on, on issues of the environment are not mandatory in more than a couple of countries around the world. Is this a, an issue that we need to address at a global level? Uh, the other was the role of the elders in um, empowering young people and how we might be able to achieve that. And then finally, there was a question on the climate emergency and whether that would end up leading to an excessive securitization uh, of the issue of climate change. Sorry, Thank could you, you very sorry, much. one, sorry. The, the, the final one was whether uh, declaring climate, uh, the climate oh. uh, situation as an emergency would uh, yeah. lead to an excessive securitization yeah. of this okay. uh, challenge. Yeah. Okay, three, three very good questions. And unfortunately, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave after that because- uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely, but thank first you. First of all, um, the, uh, the question of uh, education about the environment not being mandatory except in, in, in a few countries, actually we need a complete mindset change here. Um, it shouldn't be education in school, it's education for life. We all need to be um, involved in self-educating where it's necessary, but, but actually seeing uh, the, the transition we have to make as a huge educational as well as other challenge. And therefore we have to prepare for it. We have to plan for it. We have to be ready for it. And that means it's, so I, I think we go beyond, uh, I, I would like to see education in schools transform itself to be um, an education for living um, at a time of climate crisis, you know, right across the board. And um, so that every course, um, you know, has some elements in it and, and it's holistic. Um, and it's also future looking. <laughs> um, so that's my answer to the first question. Uh, my answer to the second one is um, the elders are really very keen on intergenerational uh, conversation. And we know that this has changed, as I said in my speech, this is no longer a kind of patronizing elder to young person speech. No, it is a very balanced learning together conversation because you're also digitally smart. You're on social media, which I'm not. You are, you know, you can lift facts out of Google as fast as anything and inform yourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a digital divide. I know that too. We have to bridge that divide as quickly as possible, but still, but if you go to the website of the elders, which is the elders.org, you'll see that we have given space for blogs by young climate activists that I often quote, as I did in my speech today. Um, I quote Shea Bastida. I'm a great fan of her. She's a young Mexican, 18-year-old uh, who's studying now in the States. Um, and she and I have a great friendship now because we built it up over time and we're learning together and influencing each other. And that's the way it should be. And finally, the point about declaring a climate emergency is a very interesting one. Some countries, and I'm sorry to say my own country was one of them, declared a climate emergency last year that wasn't very meaningful. Now we're getting into a more meaningful position with better climate policy, but we, you know, <laughs> uh, it, it was words. Uh, we need every country to take seriously the climate emergency, whether they declare it or not, and take, and take the actions necessary, not the words, not the rhetoric, and then um, we will, and, and they have to do it, as I said, in their nationally determined contributions leading up to COP26 in Glasgow. And that has to begin with, on the 12th of December with some big countries. Um, um, Britain has given some lead in that. Some people say um, a cut in emissions of 68% by 2030 is not enough, that the UK actually could do more. But at least it is the beginnings of the kind of leadership we need. And uh, the EU has said, at least 55%, maybe it can go higher by 2030. So we're on the right road, but we need everybody to buy in. And that needs all the pressure from all you wonderful young people all around the world, keeping the faith, keeping up the pressure, but also having self-care and minding, minding yourselves as well. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I really, really appreciate your your time, your your wisdom, your words. Uh, thank you very, very much, and your values, which are which uh, which you know will stay with us forever. Uh, I also wanted to say that I'm delighted. Uh, you know, uh, I know she uh, that you know you're you're connected with Shia. Shia was is actually a very much a precious part of the Bob family, and Good. and was uh, with us on the opening of the of the festival and. Uh, also at the WSDF, which is the pop movement sister organization. So thank you very much. And we want to be able to promote much more of this intergenerational collaboration and, and conversation, learning and growing. And uh, we, we want to thank you very much for helping to make that happen right here and support us in this process. And I hope this is the start of many, many, many more interactions and uh, invaluable opportunities to learn together with you. Thank you. Um, and it's certainly done my heart good. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you ever so much. Before before we close, I wondered if we could request you for a split second just to get a picture together, please. Sure. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. For everyone who can turn on their cameras, please. Okay. Thank you. Many thanks, Your Excellency. Okay. Not at all. It's such a pleasure and honor. Okay. Many <laughs> look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. Google, could you please end the meeting? Komal? Komal, can you hear me? Yes, sure. I'm ending the meeting.